morning, everyone, and welcome to our second session of Hand Therapy Essentials. Our topic for this evening is flexor tendon injuries and will be hosted by me, uh, Becky Dudeski from Elon University, North Carolina, and Dr. Ahmed Gupta. Tonight, our faculty also include Dr. Kevin Malone, Dr. Sanu Jain, Dr. Chia Wu, Becky Saunders, and Srikant Chinchalkar. As you'll see here, um, our disclosures. Zoom etiquette for this evening, all of your microphones have been turned off and your videos have also been turned off. And we ask that you use the Q&A box for any questions you have related to the discussion topic. Some of those will be answered within the Q&A box, others will be answered live by our um, presenters. Please don't use the chat box for your questions. Our learning objectives for this evening are that we will highlight the relationships between the hand surgeon and the hand therapist. We will analyze coordination, communication, and handovers in patient care as they relate to the hand surgeon working in collaboration with hand therapists. We will explain the importance of postoperative care and the need for collaboration between surgeons and therapists. We will exchange perspectives on patient-centered care using case examples. And we will recognize the role of the interprofessional healthcare team in achieving quality patient outcomes. Our agenda for this evening, Dr. Gupta will start us off by um, talking about what is known about flexor tendon injuries and why we do what we do. Key concepts for rehabilitation after tendon repair, tenolysis and secondary procedures will be presented by Becky, myself and Shrikant. And then we'll hear case presentations and discussions by Dr. Malone, Dr. Jane and Dr. Wu. So with that, I will stop sharing and invite Dr. Gupta to get us started. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. And <clears throat> so my charge is to talk about to what is known about flexor tendon injuries and why we do what we do. That is the scientific basis of flexor tendon rehab. So what I've done is I've uh, scoured the literature and uh, picked out some of the pearls for you for this talk. So there are no conflicts related to this presentation. Flexor tendon rehab, what is it? It's basically control of tendon healing. And in order to understand tendon healing, we have to understand the factors which influence tendon healing. Those are extrinsic factors and intrinsic factors. The extrinsic factors are type of injury, whether it's simple injury or complex injury, which has uh, fractures and uh, neurovascular injuries. Uh, and it makes a difference uh, whether the patient is compliant or not, what type of anesthesia are using, are using volant or using um, a block anesthesia, what type of surgical technique and rehab program you use. So here's a case of a flexor tendon injury. As you can see, uh, this is after the repair on the table. So delayed primary repair of FTP5 on the 40th day post-injury. And if you take a closer look at the repair site, you see this is the repair uh, in zone two at the A4 pulley level. The A4 pulley has been uh, cut open to, uh, to uh, vented, and A3 has been vented, and there's no gapping after repair. And this is at uh, post-operative fourth month. So um, <clears throat> the intrinsic factors which influence tendon healing are biological and biomechanical. The biological ones are tendon nutrition, healing of the tendon, tendon remodeling, and morphology of the tendon. The, uh, let's look at one by one, tendon nutrition, we know that there's segmental vascular supply, there's diffusion from the synovial fluid, especially on the volar side, and then there's this thing called the synovial pump. So the most of the tendon on the dorsal side is uh, supplied by the vessels. On the proximal part, it's the vessels from the arch and from the common digital arteries here, and then from the vinculi longae and vinculi brevae uh, up to the and longitudinal vessels in the uh, tendon itself. And there are these two digital arteries and they uh, communicate with each other just at the uh, proximal border of the, um, uh, of the joints. And these are called Edwards arcades. From these Edward arcades rise these vessels, the vinculi longae and vinculi brevae. And here you can see the dissection that we did and it shows the uh, segmental supply of the dorsal portion of the tendon. And here it's going across and here you see the vinculi longae and the vinculi short vinculi or vinculi brevae. And this shows the uh, dorsal vessels, longitudinal vessels, and therefore we put the switches on the volar surface. But the tendons can heal without that. We can heal by synovial diffusion. And this was a classic experiment by Goran Lundberg. He repaired the tendon, put it in a synovial pouch in the knee of a rabbit, and it healed because it uh, healed by synovial diffusion uh, without any vascular supply. So it's a combination. 
if you look at the collagen of the tendon on the uh, lo tendons are longitudinal collagen, the inner surface of the pulleys are transverse. So between the transverse and the longitudinal, there's a lattice work formation. As the tendon moves and glides, it uh, traps uh, particles of the synovial fluid and it, this is pushed into the tendon on the volar surface. This is the so-called synovial pump. How does the tendon heal? It heals by intrinsic healing, by regeneration of uh, flexor tendons or tenocytes. And this is like bone, primary bone healing. So this was uh, championed by Lundberg, Mansky, Gelberman, Matthews and Richards. But also there's another method of healing by extrinsic fibroblast from tendon sheath. And the 60 potenza and peacock were big proponents for this. Uh, but there is a combination. There's a, a you know middle ground that union is first affected by proliferation of sheath cells followed by the primary tendon healing or tenocytes. How does the tendon remodel? Uh, well, if you start early motion, it results in fewer adhesions, smoother gliding surface, and it stimulates the intrinsic healing and it stimulates the remodeling process. And if you see the scanning electron microscopy of an uh, immobilized tendon, you see it's very rough and a mobilized tendon, the surface is very smooth. So it's very important for that. Immobilization, immobilization of the tendon improves the ultimate range of motion, the strength and the DNA content, the tendon nutrition and the rate of healing. But sutures are a necessary evil. But what happens when you put sutures in, there's dramatic cell depletion and cell migration from the site of suture application in these intrasynovial tendon. And this persists for about up to 14 days. And you can see this in this beautiful uh, video from uh, uh, Gus McGrowder, and here he shows that, and he shows the suture placed here, and you see this area of cell depletion. The cells are just going away right after the suture's placed, and this cell depletion persists. And these are all inflammatory cells coming in from the side, and this is what will uh, aid in the um, uh, proliferative healing uh, process. But you see this yellow part where the cells of the uh, tendons are depleted, and that's why the tendon softens, and therefore, you have to take that into account when you talk about the biomechanics of this. Uh, morphology of the tendon, it's important to recognize this. There's softening and swelling of the tendon, there are viscoelastic force of edema, there are adhesions forming, and there are stiff joints and partially open pulleys and bulky repairs. And all these things will affect how your tendon glides. If, if you have annular pulleys, vascular tissue edema, extensive tethering, joint stiffness, all these things will affect your tendon gliding. And you know that there are tendons uh, are covered with these uh, pulleys. Uh, uh, Bla uh, Doyle and Blight showed this. This is A1, A2. There's not a great distinction. Then there's A3, A4, and A5. And then there is uh, cruciate pulleys. And here we see the different uh, levels of the pulleys uh, along with the cruciate. And uh, Jinbo Tang has divided the uh, flexor tendon in injuries into these different uh, zones. Uh, zone two was sub further subdivided into multiple zones. And here again is the dissection showing the two tendons and the pulley system here, uh, the pulley system, the inner part of the pulley system. Uh, so what you do, you don't do a tight tendon repair, you can bend the pulleys. And my friend, uh, Dr. David Elliott was the one who showed us this and uh, now people have taken this up. Uh, and when I was training, uh, the dictum was to repair all pulleys so tightly. So he, uh, we had to repair all the pulleys, but now you can uh, bend the pulleys, you can cut the pulleys, A4, part of A2. Uh, and here is a flexor tendon laceration at, uh, at uh, two weeks uh, injury. And here you see that uh, uh, the repair, um, injury to the A4 level, and uh, the tendon has been pulled in, uh, and uh, so the A4 pulley was cut, it's vented. Uh, there it goes, so you don't need it. Uh, and uh, so we got a, a pulley venting. And then this goes on to, uh, it's gliding. There's a mild bowstring, always there's a little bowstringing, but that doesn't matter. So um, that, that really doesn't matter clinically. Uh, and you can, uh, once you repair it, it just goes on to heal well and it glides well. There is uh, less, uh, uh, viscoelastic forces, and uh, and this goes on to get a good, good uh, function. Biomechanically, suture strength, gap formation, tendon excursion, joint, and muscle. So suture strength. We know that um, <clears throat> two strand is weak, six strand is the strongest, uh, but how much strength do you need? For passive motion, you need about five newtons. Think of newton as an apple. Remember newton and apple, so five 
passive motion, you can pull five newtons and then it'll rupture. Light grip about 15 newtons, strong grip about 50 newtons, and tip to index pinch is about 80 or 90 newtons. So for two strand, we'll give you about 18 newtons in the uh, zero week. First week, the uh, strength decreases. Third week, it decreases slightly. And six weeks, it increases by 20%. So as you can see, uh, if you're using a light grip uh, or uh, passive motion, you can uh, most of these standards will withstand, uh, repairs will withstand this. Uh, but with uh, light grip, uh, you really need about four strand switches. So we talked about dramatic cell depletion. We, uh, we have to recognize that and take that into account. Uh, the type of repair that I use is the six strand psi repair. This was developed in Louisville, uh, and we use this uh, technique uh, coupled with uh, uh, epitene on suture. Uh, Jin Bo Tang has his own six strand repair technique, uh, gap formation. That's very bad. It's been known throughout the literature that gap formation is, is very bad, and you should avoid gap formation. So here is an uh, uh, example of that. Uh, uh, zone two FDB4 and FDB5 injury, uh, and you do a rectangular skin flap, and we'll go through that. Uh, let's, let's grab that. And so the repair, and as you can see, uh, the cruciate four strand cruciate repair in this, and that will withstand most of the rehab techniques that we use. Active flexion extension test, and you see, uh, as you can see, there will be a little gap formation. And you can see that right away at the repair time when the patient is actively flexing. You see the gap formation and you can fix that right away there. If you don't fix that, this gap will only increase and cause adhesions and cause problems. Um, <clears throat> tendon excursion is very important and you have to know uh, differential glide techniques, etc. Joint influences. Uh, what about joint influences? You want to avoid lack of complete PIP joint extension at two weeks has been shown to be determinant of poor outcome. So you want to get full uh, joint extension of the PIP at two weeks. And then muscle actions, the lumbricals can be recruited with uh, MP flexion. So we have a evolution of combined rehabilitation uh, with the repair. So this is uh, Dr. Kleiner and Dr. Kutz. These are the gentlemen who uh, told us that you, yes, you can do primary repair. And over the years, we have learned all these techniques. Uh, we have turned, learned about tendon nutrition, tendon healing, uh, and we have learned about reducing gap formation, epitinon sutures, and morphology, and all these things that we talked about. So uh, the future is the molecular manipulation of healing, gene therapy, and growth uh, manipulation. So flexor tendon repair and rehabilitation is a respect for biology and the biomechanics and application of basic knowledge in the control of healing process. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. At the moment, we don't have any questions. We do encourage participants to please put your questions in the Q&A box. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pass the mic over to Becky Saunders, who's gonna to talk to us about kind of therapeutic principles for primary flexor tendon repair. Becky, if you would turn on your video and share your screen. Okay. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Greetings from Baltimore. We just, we can't see you. Would you mind turning your, your video on? Okay, I thought I did, but I'll try again. That's down on the left. All right, got it. Perfect, there we go, great. Ta-da. Great, thank yeah. you. There we go. <laughs> so um, that was an excellent overview of the changes in the evolution of um, hand surgery. And so I, I wanted to cover just kind of some key points um, one of the things as therapists that we need to know are the zone of injury. You can't always tell by the laceration where the repair is and what exactly was injured and repaired because you can have a zone two laceration and have an intact FTP so, or an FDS. And you wanna, as therapists, we need to be able to know about that so we know if we're gonna be able to teach them isolated, gentle blocking of the FDS to encourage more gliding and not get the two tendons adhered together. So um, it's great. We need to know the type of repair was done. Um, tell you the truth, I don't have all the different types of six and four strand repaired repairs memorized, but what we need to know is how many strands were there. So um, for most early active motion or true active motion programs, you need a minimum of a four strand repair. 
And the other good thing for us to know is if there are any um, repairs that are under tension, as well as any associated injuries. Did you have to do any pulley repairs during the surgery or venting to promote gliding? And was the neurovascular bundle intact? So the factors that we look at when determining the type of therapy to program is, of course, the, you know, the surgeon's preference, but the way the patient um, presents clinically is really important. So ideally, you want to start within three to five days postoperatively. The hand has been uh, in a protected um, orthosis or postoperative dressing and immobilized and elevated so that edema has subsided. And if you can't get them in by that time, at, at least try to come in by the first week when possible. Um, the other thing we have to consider too is the patient's ability to cooperate and understand a program. Um, some patients, generally immobilization is used for um, six-year-olds and under or patients who are not able to cooperate for, you know, it could be physical or psychosocial reasons, but in general, you want to provide some form of early controlled motion so that you don't get a preponderance of adhesion formation. So we have to assess their pain and edema at the first post-operative visit. And you know you might have had a referral that said um, early active motion or true active motion, but if they get to you late and they have uh, sausage fingers and are very painful, it's not a good time to you know, continue on that vein. And you might have to start first with a modified Duran and use modalities to help decrease their pain and edema. And uh, two good sources of information uh, for details about these different protocols, Becky Nadusky has a great systematic review with Rhonda Powell for, on flexor tendon rehab in the 21st century. And there's a lot of detail about different types of protocols in there, as well as um, Nancy Cannon has a fantastic chapter in the latest edition of Rehab of the Hand. And one pearl I took away from that was, she uses a guideline of when you're assessing edema, if, the, if there's greater than a seven millimeter um, difference in edema between the uninjured digit, then they, she feels that's too swollen to start with true active and they do a passive protocol at first initially and then uh, transition them to an active motion protocol. So another important consideration is the length of time from surgery to the presentation and clinic. And this is a question I propose to the surgeons, maybe they can answer how they feel about it, but when is it too late to start true active motion? Um, I couldn't find anything hard and fast in the literature. And again, with all tendon management, you have to consider all the different factors, the you know, patient's ability to comply their presentation and make a decision about how to proceed and what protocol would be best to reach and also what their goals are. So generally with um, initial exercises, you wanna start with a slow passive flexion to help reduce edema and decrease stiffness, which re results in a decrease in the work of flexion. So it's less stressful on the tendon when you do actually start doing some sort of um, active stress. So you do um, either a modified Duran with active extension with the limits of, within the limits of their orthosis. And then in general, true active motion programs allow up to one half of an active fist for the first two weeks, and then progress to a full fist by four weeks, and they're performing it with the wrist in extension at least 30 degrees. And uh, I think Dr. LeBlanc um, recommends 45 degrees when doing going for a full fist. But, and again, I, when I, I tell patients, um, you know, it's great. We want you to be able to do a full fist passively, but don't try to do that actively and don't hold in that position because it's, you know, the last third of a fist has the greatest amount of stress on the repaired tendons. So during the course of therapy, and especially the first two weeks, as Dr. Gupta pointed out, it's really important to monitor for the development of PIP flexion contractures and um, have them start early on, you know, manually blocking their MP in full passive flexion and then performing IP extension. And a lot of times, um, have to spend a lot of time on that with patients because they're afraid of, uh, sometimes I think we instill too much fear, <laughs> but they're afraid of uh, stretching the tendon that much. Even when you, you know, assure them if they get their MP down in full flexion, it's gonna be, you know, safe to do. So that's something you need to keep your eye on and, and measure frequently. And it's good, I try to see acute tendon patients, you know, I would say, in the first four weeks, twice a week, whenever possible, because it's much easier to prevent complications than it is to fix them once they happen. So 
that's getting increasingly difficult with high co-pays and uh, but it's a it's a good goal and then i tell them you can transition to one time a week you know if things are going well and you're progressing well so between four to six weeks, you want to continue to progress their active and passive range of motion. In general, protective orthoses can be discharged around six weeks. But here again, you have to use caution and look at the particular patient. Somebody who has you know, multiple zone two repairs and is making a full fist might need protection a little bit longer because they're not having any adhesion formation. And in general, at this time, you can start light activities and um, you also, if there are PIP flexion contractures haven't resolved with the exercise, then you might need to start doing some night extension splinting. By eight weeks, in general, you can start light resistive exercise and then progress the resistance over the next few weeks. But um, for manual laborers, they generally don't return to heavy prolonged grip tasks and unrestricted use of the hand until about 12 weeks. So this is a patient I was very excited. We have a couple doctors that are you know, all gung-ho gung for true active motion. And um, this was his motion at about, oh, eight weeks. So he had a, a zone two FDS, FDP repair and his date of surgery was February 6th. He had a sharp injury right across his vulvar PIP while cooking. And um, he was initially seen by the doctor at, at 10 days. So we were a little behind the eight ball there and saw him that day and got him started with a protective orthosis and started on a home program with true active motion. And um, this was his attempt at a hook fist at eight weeks. So he also, um, he had pretty decent motion in his initial motion. He had 35 degrees of PIP motion and 20 degrees of DIP motion, but he also had a 20 degree um, PIP extension leg and a 10 degree DIP extension leg. And he also had, um, I'm not a, I'd like to do a study about this. I'm not a big fan of chromic sutures. I think they prolong the inflammatory response and that they make it uncomfortable for the patient to do passive range, to do fluid massage and things like that. And that was definitely the case with him. I think at the first visit, I started encouraging him to soak his hand because he had a lot of eschar too over, over the incision line, but and it was just making him really stiff. So I encouraged him right away to like soak your hand a couple times a day so that dead skin comes off and you'll be more comfortable trying to move it. But one of the problems um, you might find is that because the IPs are so stiff, they hyperflex at the MP joint. And that was definitely the case with him. So we worked on that. And at eight weeks, um, and, and definitely you don't have to wait that long to do this, but um, some authors say you can start doing it at, you know, at five weeks, just want to carefully control the contraction if you do it that early. But we did um, FES to his FDS. It's really hard to isolate the FDP. And so if I feel like if I stimulate the FDS and we're getting, you know, strong contraction there, it definitely helps improve excursion. So this was part of his therapy in the clinic. He did it for 15 minutes and did 15 minutes of a hook fist as well as uh, 15 minutes of composite fisting. And now we're at 10 weeks and he's still, his hook fist is improving, but he still tends to hyperflex at the MP joint. So I decided, um, you know, he's encouraging him to use his hand more functionally. His extension legs, we managed with his blocked MP flexion extension or exercise during the day, but then I made him a scar mold at night that supported the IPs and his extension. And then um, to help block that very flexible MP, made a custom uh, MP flexion block orthosis that he used during functional activities. And we started that at about 10 weeks. And again, you know, that would have been um, nice to maybe start a little bit earlier, but I was concerned about putting, giving him too much resistance since he was gonna be using it most of the time during the day. So um, today I saw him for an eval and now I can't see my numbers, but you can. So. His motion's definitely improving. He's made some nice gains over the past month. He's gained 30 degrees at his PIP, and I think it was like 25 at his DIP, but still has a way to go because he's a, he's a propane tank installer. And so he needs, that's his dominant hand and he needs a, a good powerful grip. Okay. 
Thanks so much, Becky. We've got a question for you from the audience. Uh, the question from Betty is, what is the advantage of using functional electrical stimulation if a patient is able to actively contract the muscle? They can get a stronger contraction and help pull through the, the scar tissue. And it, a lot of times um, they did just get, especially those patients I re referred to, but I didn't mention, somebody who had an injury for two weeks and then didn't get it repaired, Till two weeks later, they're going to have more atrophy. They're going to have more disassociation between their their brain, and so it can be very helpful with that. And, and sometimes I've done it with uh, patients just the first time to get them to be able to get a strong, strong contraction. But it definitely helped him, especially doing the blocking exercises while he did it. Becky, what um, what would you say is the earliest that you're comfortable to begin electrical stimulation after a tendon repair? For a contraction, um, I would, you know, for functional electrical stim, I've done it as early as like five weeks and, you know, talk to the surgeon about it based on, you know, their, how they're progressing and how stiff they are. They'll, they'll usually go, you just have to, you know, turn it up very slowly. You don't want to go for a tetanic contraction. But. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, Becky, do you, you, you're up for one more question? Sure. Um, Sharon wants to know your thoughts on place and hold in the small finger for range of motion um, and IP of the thumb. So thinking about IP of the thumb and or place and hold for the small finger. Um, I, I think they're fine to, to do if you've got somebody that is uh, too swollen and can't do true active motion or is, is having a hard time. Um, doing that definitely wouldn't do it at the extreme end of the range, especially early on. Um, but there's a place for still a place for place and hold exercises. And, um, you know, sometimes too, especially with the thumb. Um, I know that, you know, some people say, you know, you never block the small finger to do IP flexion. But I think after you get past eight weeks, you know, I, I usually have them block it laterally, but just to help them isolate it. So that's another thing that helps get their motion back. Dr. Gupta, do you have any, um, I guess, what are your thoughts on the small finger, the size of the tendons? And if you were gonna give the therapists any direction in terms of blocking the small finger, do you have any suggestions in that regard? Yes, I, um, I try not to repair the two tendons in the small finger. Certainly uh, I'll repair one tendon and, um, so then you don't get a bulky repair. And I'm very careful with the small finger. I do not like the small finger in any way, you know, <laughs> uh, for um, uh, joint replacement, fractures, small finger is troublesome. And so, um, you know, we'll try to get the PIP extension early, but I also try to avoid the final few degrees of uh, uh, in an active contract contraction because, you know, Jin Botang has shown biomechanically the, that's the highest forces on the flexor tendon. Plus, if you have uh, viscoelastic forces of edema, uh, stiff joints, that increases the force uh, on that dramatically. So, yes, uh, uh, you have to be very careful with the small thing, for sure. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. And Becky, thank you for a great presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on, and I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about tenolysis. All right, so let's look at some key concept for rehabilitation um, after tenolysis. So since we're only supposed to have a couple minutes with you for these didactics, I just decided to um, take after um, Chai Mudgal and think about what our top five indications are for therapy are. What are we thinking? What are the top five things we think about after tenolysis from a therapy perspective? So number five, um, and these are kind of in no order, but they're, you'll see somewhat in chronological order. So number five would be to maximize passive range of motion before tenolysis. And this may seem obvious, but sometimes I think we get ahead of ourselves and we're so excited about moving forward towards the tenolysis that we're not stopping to make sure that we've maximized passive range. And so if you go back to Dr. Strickland, all the way back to 1985, and I was actually chuckling as I was putting this talk together, because 1985 didn't seem that long ago, a couple of days ago, and now it's a long time ago. But um, Dr. Strickland really asked us to consistently monitor the differential between active and passive range of motion during flexor tendon rehab, knowing that if we see a discrepancy, if we're taking measurements and we see a discrepancy between active motion and or place and hold and passive range of motion, 
is considered in indica indicative, excuse me, of adhesion formation between the healing tendon and the surrounding structures. And so if you know me and you've been on these calls with me before, you know that I'm really curious about measurement and that measurement is really gonna give us the information we need to do a really great job in therapy. And so during and throughout therapy, really taking good active and comparing them to passive range of motion measurements are gonna give you the information you need to understand whether you have tendon adhesions. As you're thinking about that though, then the question is how do we maximize passive range of motion and how do we prepare the digit then for the tenolysis? We know that stiff joints will create resistance during post-operative rehab. So we really need to maximize that passive motion prior to tenolysis. And to all the surgeons out there, I'd really encourage you, if you are seeing that patient in your clinic and you feel like their passive range of motion is not maximized, send them back to therapy for a few weeks before that tenolysis to try to really get as much passive range of motion as possible so that, that there's less issue during the rehabilitative phase. Less so as we think about, um, the planning, we definitely want to complete a thorough preoperative assessment, education, and planning with the patient. And so really inviting the patient to sit with us and really understand what the next steps are going to be. And in my opinion, this is absolutely essential for a good outcome of a tenolysis. The first thing, again, and I'm repeating myself, I want you to do a comprehensive assessment of active and passive range of motion. I want to know before they go to the OR what the range of motion measurements were. In research, we call this baseline measurement, right? So if we want to see a change or want to know if what we did was effective, we need a baseline measurement. So our extra special good goniometry with a really good goniometer with as many numbers as possible, no rounding, no up, no down, an exact measurement so we have good baseline data to work with. We need to assess soft tissue, vascularity, and muscle strength. Certainly, if we've got weakened musculature, it's going to be difficult to pull that tendon through, especially if we're trying to break up adhesions post tenolysis. And I think this third bullet is probably one of the most important. We really need to educate our patients regarding the post-operative expectations. How often do they need to come to therapy? Let's get that schedule built right away so the patient has it planned. How are we going to help them manage their pain? What is the plan for pain management? What about wound care? If we see a patient within hours after a tenolysis, it's going to be a difficult situation. And so we wanna make sure they are expecting what is going to happen. It's great beforehand to actually, while they're not in that post-operative state, to help them understand what the home program will be before they even go to the OR. And then really, in my opinion, it's this idea of, um, oh, excuse me, sorry about that helping them understand the window of opportunity. As I was researching, kind of going back to the literature for this talk, suggestion that three weeks is all we've got, that after three weeks, you start to see kind of the window closing and the outcomes from tenolysis are going to get worse and worse and worse after three weeks. And so if we only have a three week window of opportunity, how often are we seeing the patient? How often are they doing their exercises? And are they truly expecting this three week intensive therapy experience? And like I said before, we definitely wanna get that therapy scheduled. We wanna make sure, especially for those seven days immediately post-op, that the patients are coming in to see us as often as possible. So number three, what about post-op communication? Well, from the surgeons, I need to know a lot of things. And as a flexor tendon, as someone who loves treating flexor tendons, I need to know a lot from you. If you want me to do my job well, I need to know a lot of information. I need to know how complex the dissection was. I need to know the tendon integrity, the pulley integrity. Dr. Gupta showed us a whole bunch of different ways to actually influence the tendon during surgery. Which of those was actually performed and does your therapist know about it? Were there any additional procedures? Capsulectomies are often performed with tenolysis and actually create a whole different type of rehab when we have those additional procedures. I also want to know if you were able to measure range of motion interoperatively, both passive and if it was a wide awake procedure, did you actually measure active range of motion? Because again, if I'm using a research mindset, I want to know how much range of motion you accomplished compared to my baseline and then what I'm going to get in therapy, especially during that first week. I wanna initiate therapy within 24 to 36 hours after surgery. In St. Louis, we saw patients hours after surgery, but the problem often happened that we really needed to understand how long they had not eaten prior to their surgery. So a lot of times we actually stopped and said, okay, hold on a minute. I need you to go put food in your stomach. I need you to take some time, you know, get out from under that post-operative anesthesia, because if you start too soon, you're going to have trouble. So you really want to think about if you're going to see that patient post-op, um, how soon is it after their surgery and what have they done in between? 
The other piece of this puzzle from a therapy perspective is the weekends. And so we really want to think about if you have a teen license on a Friday, you've got to have therapists in your clinic on Saturday and Sunday to make sure they're seeing this patient to make sure we optimize the outcomes of teen license. So number two, this shouldn't surprise you, move it, move it, move it. So we want to do flexion and extension to create both proximal and distal gliding. And I think the moment that I recognized all these nasty extensor lags and things that were driving me crazy in flexor tendon rehab, I realized that we spend a lot of time talking about flexion, the motion of flexion as it relates to the flexor tendons. But flexor tendons do two things. They move proximally to create flexion and they move distally to allow extension. And so we wanna make sure that the patient knows that we want them to create both motions. I want them to create flexion and extension hourly I'm including composite wrist and digit motion, differential excursion, and blocking exercises. And it was interesting, I did find a study by Debbie Schwartz um, that found that there was no significant difference with the use of a CPM. And so that kind of continuous passive motion machine that costs a lot of money and is kind of an extra trouble for your patient really did not prove um, any significant differences. Of course, we're gonna do a demon scar management and we're going to splint the patient if needed into an extended position between exercises. And we know that especially for the PIP and DIP, PIP and DIP extension is a closed pack position. So it's very safe to put that PIP and DIP in extension. The MP is better served in a flex position um, to maintain its closed pack position and the length of the ligaments, but PIP and DIP are safe to immobilize in extension. And finally, number one, don't get there in the first place. And so this for me, um, when I think about tenolysis, and I know people don't like when I say it, but I feel like sometimes tenolysis is a failure, that we have not done our job as therapists in the early phases after flexor tendon repair. And there are a lot of reasons why we can't do the job we want to do in the early phase. And I will chop those up to many different factors. But what we do know is that if we see our patients early and often after a flexor tendon repair, we should never need a tenolysis. If we do our job well, we collect data well, and we begin with the true active flexion that Becky was referring to. And with that, I will wrap up this talk and I will stop sharing my screen. And I will go ahead and I don't see any questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Shrikant Chanchalkar and he's going to talk to us about secondary procedures. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Canada. Would you so mind turning your camera on? I'm sorry to interrupt. Just sorry. Video. Sorry? Would you mind, I'm sorry, starting your video, please. Starting my video, I, I think I did. Down at the, um, well, we're not seeing your image. We see your presentation, just not your image. Oh, okay, let me redo that again, just one Down second. on the left side, you should see start video. Uh, let me minimize this just one second. Okay, there you go. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'm glad that I'm visible now. I'm, I'm too short in terms of height, so anyway, so I'm glad I'm visible now. <laughs> so good afternoon from Canada. My talk is on two-stage flexor tendon graft. We know that this is a salvage procedure. Patients have already gone through a lot. Primary repair, failure, maybe tenolysis, tendon ruptures, maybe infection. So there are many reasons why these patients require various procedure and then they end up having a salvage procedure. So around the salvage procedure, of course, we know that the first step is to do a silastic rod implant. And there may be some associated procedure along with the installation of the silastic rod in the finger. It's quite likely that the that the PIP joint releases need to be done. It's quite possible that the surgeon need to consider how the uh, bed is underneath. And they may have to do some release of the uh, collateral or accessory, not collateral, but accessory collateral ligament. And maybe it's quite likely that the surgeon may need to do some amount of ruler plate release. And after stage one, then the patient is uh, scheduled after about three to four months, maybe six months, depending on the situation. And then the second stage procedure is performed. So as a therapist, we want to make sure that everything works right this time. And it's quite likely that these patients may end up having finger stiffness, maybe tendon adhesion, maybe another failure, which we don't want to happen. 
So this is one of the, uh, my old study, which uh, is an incomplete study I was doing with Dr. Robert McFarlane, who was, who was a grandfather uh, or a hand surgery grandfather in Canada. So depending on the surgeon's preference, we may either move the patient actively without using Kleinart or some surgeons still uh, prefer the Kleinart program. However, it is very important for the surgeons to share all the procedures that, ha that they have done along uh, with uh, stage one as well as in stage two. So looking at what happens mechanically. So we know that when you take away the flexor tendons, there are various mechanical changes that occur as a result of finger not having flexor tendons on the volar side. We know that because of loss of flexors, there is a paradoxical extension of the PIP joint. And this paradoxical extension is as a result of excessive unbalanced forces of EDC and lumbricle acting at the PIP joint. So that means that the PIP joint is starting to have a tendency to go into hyperextension, especially it will be a lot more profound if the accessory collateral ligament and volar plate is released to some degree. Then later on in stage one, the initiation of PIP joint hyperextension is likely to happen and may become profound gradually over time in stage one. And since these patients are in therapy, once we know all the details, we can possibly put the PIP joint in slight flexion, maybe at 10 degrees of flexion so that we can induce 10 degree of PIP joint flexion contracture that will work like an internal splint. And then this consequence of having PIP joint going into hyperextension can be minimized. And later on, when the second stage tendon reconstruction is done, the intensity of extensor load will increase in stage one if already PIP joint is not supported in stage one. So as we start to move the profundus tendon, profundus or the graft, the tendon graft that is usually installed in a, in a place of profundus. As we start to activate profundus tendon, then the load at the PIP joint further magnifies, causing a swan neck tendency. So we'll look at the biomechanics of one tendon, three joint system. So here we have the tendon graft, the, the one which you see in the pink. So PIP joint still has an unopposed extensor force that is continuously acting, but as you start to activate the flexor deuterium profundus, or that is the graft, the lumbrical origin, if it is present, is pulling the tendon proximally. And as the lumbrical is pulled more proximally along with the tendinous force, which is coming proximally during activation of profundus tendon, then it increases the load on the PIP joint. And this increased vector in the PIP joint further causes PIP joint to go in hyperextension. So looking at this, then we uh, drew a vector analysis. We drew a number of vectors in order for us to understand why does the swan neck deformity occurs, especially in stage two uh, tendon reconstruction. So as the flexor deuterium profundus pulls the DIP joint in flexion, there's an increased load on the extensor side. So intrinsic load increases the PIP joint, causing the PIP joint to hyperextend. This in turn assists assist and pulls the middle phalanx further in hyperextension. Whereas during throughout this motion, the DIP joint remains as a, as a fulcrum. And then patients will end up having a swan neck deformity. So in order to understand this abnormal mechanics sequentially, we put our fluoroscopy unit as well as uh, the video, uh, video uh, camera, and we analyze this frame by frame to understand the mechanics that the patients normally observe. So here you can very well see that patient is initiating flexion. The DIP joint flexes first, PIP joint goes in hyperextension, and of course, MCP joint flexes. So upon activation, I'm repeating this again and again, because we need to understand this biomechanics so that we want to make sure that these, this surgery, the salvage surgery becomes successful eventually. So looking at this, once you activate the profundus tendon or tendon, tendon graft, DIP joint flexes, the lumbrical pull is pulled more proximally and combined forces of these two causes middle phalanx to ride in hyperextension and as the pull of the flexus increases over time, your MCP joint starts to flex and PIP joint starts to hyperextend. 
So if we understand this biomechanics clearly, we can take certain steps right from the beginning in order to avoid hyperextension tendency at the PIP joint and flexion of the DIP joint and so that we can avoid the swan neck tendency of these fingers. So continuation of this process over time will cause triangular ligament contraction. The reason being that is the lateral bands are held way above the dorsal axis or uh, axis of the axis at the joint uh, rotation, especially at the PIP joint. And because of the migration of lateral bands dorsal to the anatomical axis of rotation, it is going to cause prevention of PIP joint flexion. So this is something that we must understand in order for these patients not to have this mecha abnormal mechanics as they are going through the rehab process. So looking at the mechanics, we know that you may attempt passive flexion active hold or place and hold. And the moment you let go the passive flexion force at the middle phalanx, the finger will abruptly go into hyperextension. And this is typically yeah. shown as lumbrical plus sign. And especially you'll see that when you have a reduced excursion of flexor tendon, you'll have hyperflexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint. And as it is, our fourth and the fifth metacarpophalangeal joints have a tendency, a natural tendency to hyperflex due to the joint architecture. And therefore, loss of motion in one finger, in addition to this uh, phenomena, they're going to have a quadriga effect. And this is another complication that is likely to be seen, especially with two-stage flexor tendon reconstruction. So pattern mechanics, especially we covered a lot. So MCP joint hyperflexion, secondary swan neck deformity. And of course, we looked at number of cases where swan neck deformity is likely to be present. For example, if you take superficially soft from the ring finger for opponent's plasty, that finger will definitely have a swan neck tendency. But if you have a, an ulnar, uh, uh, ulnar nerve palsy and you have taken superficially soft for tendon transfers, then in those, this situation, you don't have an ulnar nerve palsy. Sorry, you don't have a swanic deformity. So this truly suggests that the intrinsics, especially the lumbrical as well as the intrusious muscle are the culprits that produces swanic tendency. So then what is the answer? What answer do we have? So the answer we have is to block the DIP joint and allow the excursion of the tendon, the tendon graft acting at the PIP joint. So we, simulated this DIP joint splinting. And of course, we identified that by blocking the DIP joint, the PIP joint flexion starts to improve. So that's uh, one, of, one of the answers. Or better yet, you can give the patient a figure of eight splint so that you're shifting the fulcrum from PIP to PIP to DIP, sorry, DIP to the PIP joint. So if the patients have hyperflexion tendency, you may have a flexion block, as you can see right here. And eventually you're going to maximize excursion of the tendon. And as the excursion of the tendon increases, you have resolved hyperflexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint. And on top of that, you have provided these patients with maximal flexion of the PIP and DIP. So from hand therapy point of view, the solution is providing these patients with the DIP joint blocking splint to increase tendon excursion or graft excursion of the PIP joint. Figure of eight splint to counterbalance extensor force and shift of fulcrum, and or induce 10 to 15 degrees of DIP joint flexion contracture to increase mechanical advantage of the PIP joint so that you are providing these patients with an internal splint produced by the volar contracture. So there, there is a lesser tendency of these patients or no tendency of these patients to go into a swan neck deformity. From surgical point of view, if the patients have a strong lumbrical sign or lumbrical plus phenomena, then it's better for these patients to have a lumbrical release in stage one. And we know that since FDS is taken off and um, sort of, uh, so you, uh, you can use FDS lip uh, to provide a tenodesis, the PIP joint, so that the PIP joint, the FDS lip is held in slight flexion and it will work in internal strength. An excessive amount of DIP joint flexion can be minimized by fusing the DIP joint or better yet in order to prevent these patients from going, going through failure after failure. Patients may be better off having flexor detrum superficialis finger with DIP joint tenodesis or arthrodesis. So in conclusion, two-stage flexor tendon graft 
reconstruction is a salvage procedure. Patients have already gone through a number of procedures before this. So it's very important for us to understand the tendon biomechanics so that we don't want to have another failure in our hands. So the patients have especially uh, minimal um, you know, swanic tendency as a result of this understanding of the biomechanics that I have present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shrikant. I am always blown away by your expertise in biomechanics and I could watch your videos a hundred times. So thank you for all that beautiful work and for sharing it with us tonight. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, although one just came up. Um, Shrikant, Sh Sharon is asking whether you would be willing to go over the quadriga effect for her, what that is. Okay. So it's, it's truly called as a quadriga effect, not not a quadrigia effect. <laughs> <laughs> quadriga a phenomena was first described by Burdan back in 1960. He described that you have four horses connected to a Roman chariot. And if one of the reins becomes tighter, then the other horses are affected accordingly. If the one of the reins becomes slack, then other horses uh, get affected accordingly. So in other words, as uh, Verdan described that if you have loss of tendon excursion in one finger, it is likely to produce loss of excursion of the adjacent uh, tendons. For example, if you have a loss of excursion of the ring finger, your small, long, and index finger will be equally affected. So they, they'll have a reduced flexion uh, at the metacarpophalangeal uh, joint as well as interphalangeal joint. So that is a quadriga effect. Thank you very much. So one of our study that we did, we identified that the ring finger is the most notorious finger to produce quadriga. It produces stronger quadriga. The next notorious finger is your long finger. And then your index can be uh, you know, not as much, but small finger to lesser degree, but the most strongest quadriga uh, producing finger, especially the ring finger, if it is stiffer and has lost excursion of the flexor tendon. Okay, seeing no additional questions, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Dr. Malone to present our first case. All right, thanks, Becky, We're loading this up. So I do have a little bit of sort of didactic stuff as part of it as well. Uh, and a lot of this may be some uh, repetition for what Dr. Gupta, Gupta opened up with uh, for this session. So. Uh, we're going to just briefly discuss some of the surgical considerations for acute primary flexor tendon repairs uh, leading up to referral to our uh, hand therapy uh, partners. So <clears throat> we're going to you know, outline here, look at patient evaluation when they come into the office or the emergency department, a little bit about their relevant anatomy and biomechanics, and then some of the key components of our surgical management of these patients. So in general, this is a relatively uncommon injury. Uh, but it can have a variable outcome, which is very much impacted by the mechanism of injury, uh, whether our, there are associated fractures of the phalanges, uh, soft tissue defects, uh, certainly the timing of presentation and how quickly we can get these patients into the operating room and then also into therapy is going to have a big role in the outcomes, uh, surgical technique, uh, and then how compliant these patients are uh, with their therapy uh, program and post-operative restrictions are going to have a big impact on their uh, outcomes. Uh, complications are, are relatively uh, common, but not all complications are going to require secondary surgeries that have been discussed previously. Most commonly, flexor tendon lacerations occur as a result of a sharp uh, injury, penetrating injury with the finger flexed, and this results in a tendon injury at a different level than the skin injury, which is demonstrated here on this uh, diagram. Uh, so usually it's a, a hand wrapped around something sharp, uh, as on the left here, uh, in a central picture, you can see when the finger is then extended, uh, how far distal the distal stump of that intact uh, or the, the ruptured tendon is. Uh, and so that's going to play a role certainly in our surgical exposure. Neurovascular injuries, uh, injuries to the uh, common digital or excuse me, the, uh, the digital arteries and digital nerves uh, can be uh, accompanied with these and need to be evaluated and treated. Crushing mechanisms are going to re result in a much larger zone of injury. Uh, and these patients, because of this mechanism, are going to have a much higher propensity to develop adhesions, uh, contamination, wound infection, and poor outcomes. So a, a sharp injury through a narrow zone of injury is certainly uh, preferable uh, for uh, surgeons and patients. 
Uh, Dr. Kleiner uh, initially uh, identified the different zones of flexor tendons. Dr. Gupta talked about the subdivision into uh, smaller uh, distributions. Most of our attention is given to zone two injuries, which are from the initiation of the flexor tendon sheath out to the insertion of the A2 pulley, uh, which were uh, historically considered no man's land because of the poor outcomes uh, until we gained a little bit more knowledge about the uh, anatomy, uh, mechanics, and vascularity of the tendons in this layer, uh, or excuse me, in this part of the hand. Flexor tendons are composed of uh, primarily uh, type 1 collagen and tenocytes, uh, which are then uh, bundled into fascicles and covered by an adventitial layer, uh, which provides a smooth frictionless surface for gliding within the tendon sheath and gliding relative to each other for uh, FDP and FDS independent excursion. Uh, the inner surface of the sheath, as Dr. Gupta pointed out, also has this gliding adventitial surface, uh, which plays a big role not only in the frictionless environment for tendon excursion, uh, but in the uh, effusion or uh, and, and um, effusion of the synovial fluid for nourishment. Uh, and again, uh, the tendon sheaths are divided into uh, more stout annular pulleys and more flimsy cruciate pulleys over the joint levels uh, and the cruciate pulleys collapse during finger flexion, uh, resulting in our more stout annular ligaments approximating each other uh, in terminal finger flexion. Uh, the FDS tendons uh, arise in the form from a common muscle belly, but are able to act independently, uh, whereas the uh, FDP tendons have a less ability for independent tendon action. Uh, at the entrance of the A1 pulley, the FDS is typically more volar, uh, and then the FDS will wrap around uh, the FDP to become in a more deep position at the, about the mid portion of the proximal phalanx. Uh, and then the uh, FDP will consent, continue out within the pulley sheath all the way out to the base of the distal phalanx. Uh, the FDP is our primary flexor, how we initiate flexion, and then FDS and our intrinsics are oftentimes engaged for more power grip. Uh, Dr. Gupta did uh, point out uh, the vincular supply uh, for vascularity, uh, and again, to reinforce that these uh, enter the tendons on the dorsal surface of the tendon, uh, and that's the reason that we want to keep our tendon, or excuse me, our suture material uh, more volarly so that we are creating less uh, potential tissue ischemia. Uh, there are additional uh, vascular insertions onto the tendons at the bony insertion uh, interface. And we know that there is a relative avascular zone directly under the A2 and under the A4 pulley, uh, which can have a, an impact on healing. Uh, with adequate uh, pulley venting, uh, this may be uh, diminished, but uh, you know, that's where you might see attritional tendon ruptures without laceration directly under those pulleys because of the increased pressure. In terms of uh, getting these patients into the operating room, we want to get them in relatively quickly. Uh, you know, with a, within a week is great. Uh, as you get outside of a week, I know Dr. Gupta showed that case that he repaired at 40 days after uh, injury uh, without having to really go proximal in the palm to find that tendon. Uh, the outcomes from uh, delayed treatment are really not quite as good uh, and very difficult to predict. In terms of exposure, there's a variety of different surgical approaches that have been described. In order to get adequate exposure, uh, identify and manage any associated neurovascular injuries. Uh, and then, as mentioned, the pulley uh, venting uh, for exposure of the tendon injury and tendon repair is so important. Because many of these patients are holding a tight fist when the injury occurs uh, with complete injury, uh, that tendon, the proximal stumps of the FDP and FDS tendon can retract all the way up into the palm and may require more extensive approaches or secondary incisions in the palm to identify, retrieve, and then deliver the uh, tendons back out into the surgical field of the fingers. Uh, we certainly want to be very uh, atraumatic uh, when we're managing the tendons and the tendon sheath. Uh, we want to limit how much we're going to debride to avoid overshortening, which could result in conditions like quadriga. Uh, and if we have uh, uh, tissue loss, uh, we can address that at times with myotendinous lengthening in the forearm uh, to uh, get better uh, repair without significant tightening. Uh, there is some debate as to whether both tendons should be repaired uh, in the flexor tendon sheath. Uh, there is certainly evidence that creating a FDP-only finger uh, can result in good outcomes or perhaps resecting a, a slip of the FDS to minimize the bulk of the repair underneath the A2 pulley is an option. Obviously, we want to repair our digital nerves and or digital arteries if, uh, if those are identified. Uh, 
Dr. Uh, Jim Botang identified really and, and changed the, the paradigm for how we address our pulleys. Uh, forever we were told to preserve our A2 and A4 pulleys and everything else can sort of be ignored. Uh, and here he gives some examples of where the tendon laceration occurs uh, and where he believes that we can uh, release uh, adequately the pulleys uh, and, and venting techniques. Uh, and in general, we should try to minimize how much pulley we release. So we have maybe a 25 millimeter window uh, to do our tendon repair in, uh, as we uh, know that we wanna have our core sutures at least 10 millimeters in each segment uh, to get adequate fixation. Uh, so here's a case example that I have borrowed from Dr. Rizzo. Uh, and you can see here, uh, you know, in the operating room loss of flexion cascade of the ring finger, you can see that traumatic wound in the midline over the base of the proximal phalanx, just distal to the MP joint flexion crease. Uh, here is the exposure. Uh, you can see uh, the ulnar digital nerve here uh, on the lower part of our wound. Uh, here's our tendon laceration, or excuse me, our sheath laceration. Uh, but you can see, as is very common, that the distal portion of the tendon is distal to the sheath injury because of the degree of flexion at the time of the injury occurring. Uh, here uh, we have retrieved uh, the tendons. We have opened up the tendon sheath to expose uh, the distal aspects of the tendons. Uh, and then our goal is to deliver the proximal tendons out to the distal aspects of the tendons. Uh, here in the background is our A2 pulley, which is left intact. The uh, tendons have been retrieved and are now sitting superficial to the A2 pulley as they are uh, I, I first identified and tagged. Core sutures uh, are placed within the FTP and FDS tendons uh, initially, uh, and these sutures then can be used to help shuttle the tendons uh, through the pulley system, uh, which is demonstrated here. So our, our FDP and FDS tendons have been passed underneath the A2 pulley so that they are approximated with our distal stumps, uh, which are brought further proximal by flexing the finger passively. And then uh, this uh, syringe needle passing through the A2 pulley, holding the tendons there so that they don't retract further and make our tendon repair much easier. Uh, here is an example of the uh, epitendinous suture being placed along the back wall. Uh, doing this before uh, securing your core sutures can make it uh, easier to get that back wall repair. Uh, if you do it in the other order, getting that back wall repair with your epitendinous suture can be very challenging. Uh, and then the core sutures are retied. You can see a uh, very nice, minimally bulky repair uh, without uh, any gapping at this point. Uh, and then after the core sutures are tied, the more anterior aspect of the epitendinous repair is completed. Uh, to again, uh, add additional strength to the repair site, uh, smooth out uh, the repair so it's not so bulky, which can minimize the work of flexion uh, and the resistance that this repair site might see as it enters into the A2 pulley during uh, flexion. Uh, and here's the final repair. Uh, and you can see here that the flexion cascade has been restored uh, with that repair on the operating room table. Uh, Dr. Gupta did mention uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic methods of tendon repair. Uh, we do know uh, that early on, uh, these tendons do become weak uh, because of uh, you know, tissue ischemia from our sutures, and that weakness can uh, lead all the way up to 12 to 14 days after surgery, uh, which certainly plays a role in uh, our range of motion program. Uh, collagen production really begins at day five and goes all the way up to four weeks but remodeling lasts uh, several months. Uh, and during that time, we are still fairly protective of our uh, tendon repair. Uh, we prefer a more intrinsic healing, which is gonna provide that more smoother surface that Dr. Gupta showed on his uh, uh, images. Uh, more extrinsic healing is likely gonna result into greater adhesions and stiffness uh, and can be uh, impacted by, again, the mechanism of injury and uh, more traumatic uh, healing of the tissues during surgery repair and also delayed initiation of mobilization. So early protected active motion seems to favor more intrinsic healing and less adhesions. Uh, and again, other factors that are gonna promote more extrinsic healing are crushing mechanism, more traumatic tendon healing. Uh, and then for those tendons that do retract all the way up into the palm, uh, that occurs with vincula disruption. Uh, and so these uh, tendons are gonna require more extrinsic uh, healing uh, in that situation. So after we've uh, referred, uh, fixed them up, uh, sent them home, now it's off to get them uh, to uh, you all. So I'll turn over to you, thanks.
All right, so we'll ask our panelists to go ahead and um, turn on their videos. And Becky Shirkant, does anybody want to take a stab at what you're going to do first? Okay, so we have the details, especially gathered from the surgeon that, of course, he has done four strand epitendinous suture, so the, the repair is relatively quite stronger. Uh, in olden days, you used to keep the wrist in flex position. However, that is not the case nowadays. You position the wrist somewhere between zero to 30 degrees of extension. MCP is ranging from 45 to 60 degrees of flexion, depending on the neurovascular status. I will always begin with passive range of motion, especially to the limits, especially I don't want to push the finger too hard. That will cause the, the suture line to rupture or break, especially the skin suture, I mean. So once I've done about say 15 to 20 reps of uh, passive PIP joint flexion, active extension, I'll encourage patients to do that because we know, as you said, that the tendon needs to glide proximally, tendon needs to glide distally. So especially when you're applying, uh, when you're asking the person to passively flex and actively extend the finger, you're already facilitating the tendon to go distally. And then I recommend that the patient hold three fingers, especially right at the distal palmar crease. And I'll encourage the patient to flex the finger to the topmost finger and slide the finger in a valley between index and long. That will be my routine. I'll recommend him to do the passive range and active flexion to three finger distance four to five times a, four to five times during the day. Along the same line, if the patient is comfortable, then I'll encourage him to do wrist flexion, finger extension, so that the tendon glide distally, wrist extension, finger flexion, and assisted flexion, not passive flexion and active hold. So this facilitates tendon motion both proximally as well as distally. So Savage, as well as Amadio has shown that this motion, especially when you bring the wrist in extension, there's a greater differential tendon gliding between FDS and FDP. And usually what happens is the tendon adhesions usually form between the, in the area where, the, where there is the least amount of tendon motion between these two tendons. So right from the beginning, we want to have these tendons moving away from each other, the suture line away, moving away from each other and getting the tendon gliding over time. Second week, they'll do two finger distance, third week, one finger distance, and finally to the distal palmar crease. And then afterwards, I'll encourage them to perform wrist extension, sorry, finger extension with wrist in neutral, wrist in maybe 15 degrees or 30 degrees of extension, and gradually go into greater extension with the wrist and finger extension over time until they have gained full amount of motion. So this will be my my take on the management, on the. You can't, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I I'm glad you emphasized the uh, importance of the wrist motion and using the tenodesis effect of the wrist in getting differential glide between FDS and FDP. Right. Uh, in the olden days, we used to immobilize the wrist, and especially we started off with flexion of the uh, wrist. But if you look at your own wrist, if you keep the wrist in flexion, your work of flexion increases tremendously. And if you right. keep your wrist in slight uh, extension, you, your finger uh, motion becomes much easier. So keeping the wrist in extension, in fact, keeping moving the wrist is very important. So they have this Manchester splint, which allows the wrist motion, which was actually derived from the um, Indianapolis uh, concept of uh, getting some wrist motion uh, incorporated in this uh, splint itself. Right. The reason I said that three finger distance is because, you know, there's a, consistent linear distance that the patients are flexing their fingers to. Mm. So the concept of moving the fingers by 50%, patients may not exactly know what 50% is all about. You know, they, may, they may put excessive force on the tendons when they're trying to flex and the fingers are already swollen. Dr. Gupta, I would add to that. Um, I didn't do a good job of lifting it up in my talk on that last slide, but there is a beautiful open source paper by Don Lalonde and Amanda Higgins, which is the St. John Protocol, which incorporates the wrist in an extended position in the early postoperative phase with um, partial um, active range of motion and moves right. towards the Manchester short splint. And so I think right. the 
the St. John Protocol does a really beautiful job of incorporating literature, in my opinion, from the 1970s all the way through today, and really um, a progressive protocol that includes very safe, true active flexion. And it's in PRS Global Open, so anybody on this call tonight can get to that document open source, and there's videos embedded in the article. So I strongly encourage people to try to find that and take a look at Dr. Lalonde's work, because I think it's a great protocol for people to be thinking about. Becky, did you want to add anything, or Dr. Mudgall, did you have anything to add? I just wanted to add that, you know, um, to remember to make sure that they're working on get, getting full IP extension, and frequently they'll need to do that blocking exercise where they maximally flex their MPs within the orthosis if they're doing their exercises that way, or out of it with their wrist extension and work on full IP extension. And, you know, and definitely try to get that within the first few weeks, or it just gets tougher. I'm glad you emphasized that because the literature has consistently shown that if you don't get PI, full PIP extension by two weeks, your results become inferior, much inferior. So right. uh, we try our, uh, our, we try very hard to get the PIP extended right away. And that the best way you can achieve that is by flexing the MP joint. That way you recruit the lumbricle. And that hasn't, uh, we have shown, we did some studies on EMG and we've shown that doing that where you recruit the lumbricle and the lumbricle acts from its insertion, the extensor and pulls the uh, flex tendon. In fact, it relaxes the repair. So it's a, it adds a beneficial effect of that. So mm -hmm. it recruits the lumbricle muscle by flexing the MP joint and you're getting two for one. <laughs> you know, I, uh, okay. I love the discussion and I'm just wondering if I could get some therapy input on, I don't know if this has been discussed, but what do you do in zone two? Oftentimes, you may not be able to repair the FDS, so you excise the FDS. And now you got put all your eggs in one basket with a profundus repair. How do uh, different surgeons and therapists approach that particular problem? Well, you don't have to do FDS blocking, that's for sure. <laughs> that's why it's nice to know. if. You know, and, and sometimes and a lot of therapists don't have the advantage of being having access to op reports. And so it's really important to put that kind of information in your referral. And the other thing you would have to be, you know, watch out for is the development of a swan neck. So these are- I mean, I'll, 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 I'll comment on that. I had a direct discussion about the tendon biomechanics with uh, Dr. Uh, Tubiana when we met uh, in Bologna, Bologna, Italy back in I think uh, before 95, somewhere around there. So I asked him a question that I hear some different description about the mechanism of finger flexion. I heard that uh, people say that DIP joint flexes first and then PIP joint and then MCP joint follows through. He said, not really. He explained to me that, you know, even though both flexor deuterum profundus and superficialis are acting together, Superficial is being stronger will initiate PIP joint motion first. And subsequently your oblique retinacular ligament will become slack. Profundus will be able to then act effectively on the DIP joint. And as the PIP and DIP joint starts to increase, your extensor deuterum commonus especially starts to move distally. And it brings your sagittal band and extensor hood distally that is giving you an increased amount of excursion of your intrinsics and later on your metacarpophalangeal joints will flex. And that made sense because if suppose you started your motion with the DIP joint first, then the moment the DIP joint flexed, the lateral bands will be pulled more dorsally or pushed more dorsally, dorsal to the anatomical axis of rotation at PIP. And they will become a tension band. And when they become a tension band, you have what we call a snapping swan neck deformity. So now, uh, if you have not repaired flexor data and superficial, for example, in a situation because of some reason, if the finger is only one tendon acting on three joints. So in that situation, of course, we have to uh, maintain the PIP joint in slight flexion so that the PIP joint doesn't go in hyperextension. And two, we have to encourage the patient to perform flexion as we normally do because, uh, do, because by bending the PIP joint or keeping the PIP joint in slight flexion, you're already shifting the fulcrum from DIP to PIP so that the PIP joint flexes. So there's a relatively somewhat lesser load on the DIP joint and it's not going to cause dorsal, excessive dorsal translation of your lateral band above the joint axis. Great. 
Wonderful. Um, Vicky, can, can I make a comment? Um, of course. Just uh, there was a study a few years ago, uh, just a survey asking uh, hand surgeons, uh, what was their most common repair? And despite all of these very strong repairs with early active protocols, the most common one was modified Kessler two strand repair, which is not strong enough for early active motion. Um, and it's very important to, to, uh, to associate the repair type with the therapy. And communication is really critical when it comes to that. You've emphasized that. That's a, incredibly important. And the other, the other point is that functional splints imply function. And so, uh, like Emmett mentioned, you know, the wrist extension, tenodesis splints, are, they're great. But the more you allow patients to move, the more they can potentially do. And so a four strand repair is strong enough to allow for, for active motion, but it's not strong enough to allow for use. And so from a hand surgeon standpoint, if you ask the question, what is worse, a tendon adhesion or a tendon rupture? I would say, and most people would say, a tendon rupture is much worse than tendon adhesions. Yes, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll comment on the uh, Manchester splint. I mean, uh, can we really assume that every patient that we see is compliant in following our guidelines? Not really. <laughs> and if at all the person, for example, loses the balance or they are, they are given that freedom of using their hand, their likelihood of academically is fine. I mean, you're just giving them a short splint, but truly speaking, during in a functional functional. Um, sort of environment, if they're using their hand aggressively, they're, they're having greater amount of wrist extension. And if suppose they're grabbing or grasping an object, then they're likely of causing the rupture. So I would rather prevent the ruptures than you know, them having, having to go through the, uh, all the scenario that we talked about. So I'm not truly in favor of the, the short, short splint, you know, Manchester short splint. Thank you, Shirkan and Dr. Cassidy. And Dr. Cassidy, I'm gonna lift up a question that, and, and I think it speaks to your point. Your therapist can't actually organize their exercises to the number of strands crossing their repair site if they don't have that information. And so we have a lot of good literature that helps us as therapists know how to modulate our exercise programs based on the number of strands crossing the repair site. As Dr. Gupta presented, we've got a lot of information in grams and in newtons, and we know how, how much force all of our exercises produce. But without that essential key piece of information of the number of strands crossing their repair site, we are at a disadvantage. And so I think one of the major opportunities here in this talk and in these sessions is really to lift up what the therapists need from the surgeons in order to optimize the preoperative care or postoperative care. So thank you for bringing that up. And it's a great segue um, from that question as well. So I'm looking at time and I want to be mindful of people's time. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Dr. Jane to go ahead and um, boot up his case study. And I believe we're gonna be talking about um, tenolysis. Yes, that's what I thought. Awesome, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. We sure thanks, can. Thanks, thanks, Becky. So I'm gonna jump right into a case here. Becky gave cool. such a great overview of salient points to be aware of for tenolysis. And rather than putting something very simple what about a combined injury where you have more than just a flexor tendon involved? Because the flexor tendon is still part of a significant portion of this rehabilitation. So I had this young gentleman who uh, had this dorsal table saw injury that went all the way down to the palmar skin. So basically everything down short of the skin. If it cut through the skin, it would have been a complete uh, hand amputation. So we did what we needed to do and 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 fix this in the operating room. Uh, multiple things were, were cut and, and uh, you can see we, we fixed a lot of different structures, including the flexor tendons, nerves, and uh, blood vessels. And so going uh, post-operative here, because you know, you're going to fix this, uh, this hand. And so you're about, uh, this is pictures one month post-op, but I wanted to uh, have some discussion here. And, and, and Beck, if you, leave, if you can leave this, regarding what would the panel's thoughts be in terms of rehabilitation in this scenario at this point in time? And there are, they're obviously going to be leading toward other scenarios too. So this is not the, uh, the end of the case. All right. So Becky or Shrikant, would you like to jump in here and offer some suggestions about what you might be thinking about for this patient? So I'll let uh, Becky answer the question and then I'll take the, uh, take the next time. Well, I would definitely want to start some form of early motion because you're going to have a lot of scar formation and 
a lot of adhesions and swelling. So I would start with some um, gentle, active, protected, you know, small arc flexion and extension of the wrist. And, but he got his, he got those too, right? So you would have to start with passively and then um, doing, performing, a, you know, blocked MP flexion, like a, a lumbrical plus type flexion and extension and a small arc and then a hook fist, pretty much based on um, Pam Silverman's protocol for uh, replants. But well, I'll comment on that. So uh, we have, I was Sorry. just checking the op note to see if wrist, the wrist um, extensors and flexors were involved too. So you know, whatever you can move actively, move actively within a safe range and the things that you can't move actively yet, you have to do some sort of uh, protected passive range. Yeah, yeah, everything was in the hand. I think it barely got the ECRL partially, but all the wrist flexors and extensors are intact. So Dr. Jane, my question for you as the therapist, I'm gonna come to your office and tell me, Dr. Jane, if we're gonna, in the words of the previous kind of conversation, if we're gonna lose something here, would you rather I lose flexors or extensors? Oh, I, I'd rather lose extensors. I mean, I think it's critically important to get uh, grip back in this patient because that's what he needs. And so you're leading to, you know, my, my, my question uh, with regard to this. So you, you do the protocol and, uh, and actually I should, I should actually let me stop because I'm going to uh, let, uh, let you all finish before I give my thoughts. So I'm thinking about a balance, right? I want to try to do the best that I can that I can to position proximal joints to mobilize distal joints. So I know if I put the wrist in extension, I can probably mobilize the MP joints. PIPs and DIPs the same. And I want to be cautious in all of that. But I want to remember the entire time in this rehab, it's all a balance. So if I do too much of one or too much of the other, I risk the opposite extreme. And so I think the real challenge point here are these fractures and trying to at least get the tendons gliding enough past the fractures um, without losing anything in the in-between. And so I think this is where a little bit of motion goes a long way, but being very cautious. I would not put this case in the hands of a newer therapist. I would really want some strong mentorship from a therapist who's got enough experience to be watching things pretty closely. Two big things that I see right out of the gate though, I'm really worried about the swelling and I'm really worried about the pin site care and how my patient is going to feel psychologically about moving this hand that looks like this because I think fear is a factor that we have to really overcome in helping patients to begin motion early when, when their hand looks like this postoperatively. I think they're very afraid. So postoperatively, I would, I would have positioned this person in resistance about maybe 30 degrees of extension, MCPs at in flex, 45 degrees of uh, flexion. And then I would encourage him to perform forearm rotation, especially for a reason, because if your forearm is in a pronated position, then your volar radial nerve ligament is going to be taut or tight. Secondly, your flexor muscles that are originating from the medial epicondyle are slack, so they become tight, and then forearm rotation becomes challenging. So post-operatively, I'll encourage him to perform forearm rotation. That is the beginning, uh, the start of therapy to start off with. And then later on, especially about 10 day mark, then I'll encourage him to perform wrist flexion, finger extension, short arc only, wrist extension, finger flexion. And especially if you look at the PIP joint, PIP joints are in flex position, so they're likely of developing PIP joint flexion contractures, I should have positioned them, uh, or, I mean, I, I should position them in PIP joint in neutral position. And then they can hold the fingers, especially at the metacarpophalangeal joint and perform about 30 degrees of PIP joint flexion and extension, 30 degrees of flexion and extension at the PIP joint. And especially you can imagine that your intrinsics are also traumatized, especially being there. So eventually these patients are likely of going into an intrinsic negative hand. So this is something which I would be concerned about in uh, later stages of his rehab. Thanks. You know, so this patient developed some contracture at the MP joints as well as the PIP joints, as you can see, this is early on, but even later on, and uh, also had extrinsic tightness. And um, 
had also limited ability to really make a fist. And, and, and so therefore you're in the scenario, A, would you, what would you address first, the flexors or extensors? And what would be your timing be from the initial surgery? I want flexors first, and I would love to see this person within three to four days post-op. Yeah, I think the, um, I think um, getting them in a protective positional orthosis early on could help prevent some of the um, contractures and, you know, definitely getting in, into therapy, like, you know, within a week of the injury, because there's a lot of things we can do to address the swelling as well. And like Becky said, address their, um, you know, fears and concerns. Uh, I would work on both. I would work on extensors as well as flexors because we know that the flexors are relatively a lot more stronger. They already have a mechanical advantage uh, over extensors and extensors are probably maybe four to six times weaker than, than flexors. So I, I would rather keep a balance between extensors and flexors so that Great. they're not having strong flexion contracture or going into flexion contracture over time. Yeah, and so, you know, I had a similar thought. So. Uh, let's see, sorry, I'm trying to advance that. Um, oh, sorry. So um, essentially we went about five months post-injury. About four months is when I try to usually consider tenolysis and give therapy a chance. And you could uh, you know, argue, I think a little bit earlier, a little bit later, depending upon your scenario. And uh, I chose flexors for a couple of reasons. One is the importance, but the other thing is also, I felt if I could get the flexors to improve, get the scar out of there, my flexors, as you, as you mentioned earlier, Shikant, that if you know, they're stronger. So even if I have a little bit of extrinsic tightness, I might be able to overpower them with my flexors uh, if they fully work, if I can get them to even reach uh, partially uh, toward the palm better. Um, and as long as I get the tendons gliding, I, I can go from there. So we did that. And so I think one of the key things I wanna bring uh, to everybody's attention is there's these great tenolysis blades uh, that I like using and they're great uh, because they really can get, and not in this case specifically, but if you're working the fingers, they can really get into the pulleys and release the flexor tendons on both the volar and dorsal surfaces. And they have these uh, side uh, uh, dividers too as well, so they can release the tendon from the radial ulnar aspect as well. So these are, these are key to uh, have available if you're able to have it. But otherwise you can use a free elevator, uh, not, as, not as strong or, or a blade or scissors, but I, I like these, especially if you have to go underneath the tunnel to do this. But if you're doing an open uh, release, uh, you don't necessarily need these for those. And I also did some manipulation at the time just to sort of see if it can release a little bit of the uh, stiffness in the joints. So um, I'll move on just for the sake of time here. Post-injury, about seven months healed. Um, obviously there's multiple injuries here going uh, and I, so one thing I want to mention, I did uh, the tenolysis under uh, Mac local. So you could do wide awake local as well. Um, sometimes for a bigger operation or somebody's a little nervous, I will do the Mac local and wake them up and have them uh, test out their repair to make sure that I did improve their range of motion. And I did for both the flexor. And then I came back later 10 months due to the extensors. And then I, his median nerve uh, was a separate story and I did a reconstruction. At that time, I also released a little bit more of the flexors from the scar tissue. Uh, at, at that time. And so um, a big operation, but so he's 21 months uh, post, uh, post uh, surgery, his initial surgery. And you can see what we have here. And I'm just gonna show this video. Impressive. I was going to say, Dr. Jane, you've got some really good therapists there at the Ohio State University. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and, and you're not so bad yourself. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about uh, his thumb. Does he have a good opposition, though? I mean, I didn't see it. I see some wasting of his uh, Tina remnants. Yeah. So um, during his, his initial nerve repair at the uh, uh, index operation, didn't work well for his, his own nerve worked well. Median didn't, so I had to revise that, and I could not repair. There's no target for the uh, motor branch, so his we we're discussing, and he has a lot of joint stiffness from having a base of the thumb metacarpal uh, 
amputation essentially. Um, so we talked about doing it eventually, hopefully getting a tendon transfer to hopefully give him some opposition. That's probably the last surgery that I'll offer him once he gets his median nerve function. So I actually had to go back and reconstruct his median nerve with sural nerve allograph, or sural nerve autograph, sorry, slipped my tongue there. And uh, he's actually recovering quite well and actually getting uh, function at the uh, appropriate level that I expect him to be postoperatively from the time of the surgery. And from sensation point of view, how much uh, sens sensation does he have? He has a uh, protective sensation. Uh, you know, not that he does not have, he, it's, it's improving. He's not fully there yet. So he has sensation about mid palm. His ulnar nerves working quite well. Uh, he's getting to about uh, proximal phalanx of the thumb. So we're, he's still, he's about six months out from that. And from his initial, uh, sorry, the, uh, the uh, proximal portion of his nerve graft, he's still in the recovery, but where he's having that recovery, he's actually, he's actually can feel light touch and sharp. Um, and as far as two point, he's probably, a, you know, he ranges anywhere from 12 to 14 right now in, in those areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Jane, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. And we are going to stay a couple minutes over. And so um, we recognize we're at time, but we're going to extend to about 845. So we hope you'll stay with us. And Dr. Wu, I'm going to pass the baton to you for our final case presentation and discussion of the evening. All right, let me load up my screen. <clears throat> so I was uh, charged with giving a talk on the um, pulley reconstruction part. So uh, you heard a lot of great speakers today. Um, th today, when I'm for the pulley part, I'm going to start uh, with a simple base case, a uh, quick review of the anatomy, um, talk about some of the non-operative treatment for some of the more garden variety flavors, and then finally the operative treatment, of course, um, with an emphasis on therapy. So our patient here is a 40 year old weekend warrior that um, had a, came to our office with acute onset of ring finger pain and a swelling after a thing, uh, camping trip. Uh, reports there's no direct impact, but I heard something pop when um, this patient was uh, climbing the rocks. And uh, this is the physical exam finding that you see right here. So let me show you on the left side. So here you can see there's a subtle bow stringing and there's actually increased work of flexion. You can see it takes a little bit to get over that and it becomes a little bit easier. And when I try to simulate the pulley by holding down the finger with my thumb, you can see it is much easier, much more of a smoother motion. Um, of course, uh, this can happen uh, with other types of pulley injury, including some of which are iatrogenic, which I've seen uh, from very aggressive trigger finger releases. And certainly you can see that uh, with uh, multiple flexor tendon revision surgeries. And uh, that's all in uh, part of the consideration. Um, so exactly what does a pulley do? So it's essentially a piece of tissue on the volo aspect of the thumb. It creates a fiber osseous tunnel. And the point of this tunnel is to maintain flexors relationship to the long axis of the finger. And it serves the purpose uh, to keep the tendon as close to the bone as possible. So it can transfer the linear force of the muscle contraction, that is the extrinsics, into an efficient flexor moment at the joint. So because of this, if the pulley is disrupted, I think it makes sense for us to think that the distance between the tendon and the bone will increase, which is exactly what we see in the case of bow stringing. However, in the setting of um, <clears throat> Uh, pulley injuries, oftentimes, especially for those that are spraying or partial rupture, you don't actually always clinically see bow stringing. Um, what they typically come to the clinic presenting is more likely patients complaining of loss of power in their grip, reduced range of motion. For the really chronic cases, they can actually uh, present with fixed flexion contraction. So uh, there's actually a lot of uh, symptoms a patient will come in masquerading uh, when the really underlying cause is the bow stringing. As you can see in the picture right here, there's increased distance between the tendon and the bone itself. And uh, sometimes it can be more subtle than you think for this reason. So if there's any question that's not clear based on your phys history and physical exam finding, uh, one thing that you can do is consider either an ultrasound or MRI. There's literature support uh, for its use in terms of diagnosis. Generally speaking, um, this is a, a study by Dr. Shuffle. Uh, the tendon and bone distance, if it's greater than two millimeters, as you can see in the MRI images here, uh, that's considered an injury to the, to the pulley. And um, 
uh, generally speaking, um, you can classify these into four grades. So grade one is fully strained, um, no increase in tendon bone distance. These are typically treated non-operatively. Grade two is a complete rupture of the A4 and or partial rupture of the A2, which can also be treated non-operatively. As you go up to grade three and four, uh, not surprisingly, they tend to be more operative driven. So specifically grade three is complete rupture of A2 uh, and grade four is multiple uh, tendon ruptures. So uh, for you know the simple grade one and grade twos, the strain and the partial ruptures, I uh, just wanted to turn it over to our expert therapist to see, you know, when you see these patients in clinic, uh, do you have any recommendations? How do you approach uh, these uh, when you first see them uh, refer to your clinic? Well, with any acute injury, you want to control, you know, pain and edema. And uh, based on the history, you, you know, it, it, you pretty much have a good idea of what happens. So the thermoplastic pulley rings are helpful to give them support while they can move in a pain-free range and then um, consult the surgeon. <laughs> How long are you going to try conservative management before you go on to doing, you know, something more definitive? thoughts? Yeah, usually patients who are into rock climbing and they have, uh, I mean, they have a fully rupture, but associated with that is they have a tenosynovitis. So initially, you know, you want to control their uh, inflammation. You want to provide them with the pulley ring uh, uh, splints. You only want to allow them uh, pain-free range of motion so that they don't become tethered, the tendons don't become tethered. And uh, later on, once their tenosynovitis symptoms subside, then you know if the patients are showing recovery in terms of their range of motion well and good. If not, then uh, send uh, send the back, a patient back to the surgeon for a surgical consult. Do you guys have any uh, thoughts on using different kinds of tape uh, versus orthoplast splint versus these pre-made plastic uh, um, uh, splints? Uh, any opinions? Uh, do you use them in different situations, or you kind of think of them a little the same? So I'll, I'll, my preference is to use the thermoplastic custom-made splints for these individuals rather than off the shelf because off the shelf may be putting a lot of pressure on the uh, on the skin that, that is already inflamed. They may have some some kind of a skin uh, necrosis or maybe some kind of ischemia. We don't want that. And uh, on top of that, you know, they may not allow adequate amount of stability at the pulley side. And they may they may interfere with motion to uh, some degree as well. Can I be the devil's advocate here, Becky? Sure. <laughs> you know the, the the reason the flexor tendons bow is because the momentum is increased and they're falling away from the bone. And I find it very hard to understand how a stiff pulley ring can effectively provide the kind of restoration of that momentum which is why after having tried it for a few years, I went away from it and I've gone to using Coban as a dermal pulley ring. And it allows just that gentle amount of compression and gets the tendon back. And I, I can tell you, once I started doing that, I have rarely found any reason to go back to a uh, non-compressible pulley ring, if you want to call it that. So just my two cents. <sighs> Do you think that's more effective than taping? Uh, any, anything that is a little more compliant or pliable as opposed to orthoplast mm -hmm. or something that's stiffer, it just seems to allow this. That's why I call it a dermal pulley ring. It's not what you're doing with the stuff. It's what's forcing the skin and the flexor sheath and the tendons closer to the bone, reducing the work of flexion. So mm -hmm. What you do it with doesn't matter as long as it's not stiff. Good point. In terms you know, of... Uh, there, there's a subgroup of competitive rock climbers who look forward to having pulley ruptures because it increases their momentum across their PIP joints. <laughs> they think they think it makes it, it, it they think it makes them better rock climbers actually. <laughs> Dr. Wu, we'll let you keep going with this case. Sounds good. So uh, for grade three and grade four injuries, typically they're treated non-operatively or uh, sometimes if you have non-compliant patients. So typically I will give these people at least uh, chance minimum of eight up to 12 weeks to 
uh, be considered a full course of non-operative treatment. But if there is some clinical suspicion that there's a complete rupture of A2 or multiple pulley, you know, you can generally proceed to uh, reconstruction. So there's uh, multiple methods of reconstruction. So I listed uh, among them, you know, two of the most popular. Uh, I generally favor the one on the right, uh, the belt and loop technique. Uh, it's being shown to be biomechanically stronger uh, in cadavers. Uh, of course, we're talking about, you know, athletes here, but it's important to know, of course, uh, these uh, incompetent pulleys can happen with uh, revision flexor tendon surgery, uh, aggressive trigger finger release, which I've seen. Um, prior to undertaking these uh, uh, reconstructions uh, from a surgical standpoint, I think it's uh, important to make sure uh, that the surgical side is free of infection. There's a supple full passive range of motion and uh, there's uh, um, not any scars uh, as much as that is within your control as possible. And uh, there's also consideration uh, for doing the uh, actual tendon graft uh, separately uh, from the, uh, the actual pulley reconstruction. So perhaps uh, just considering doing uh, uh, the um, uh, silicone rod with the pulley reconstruction first and then come back and stage it and uh, actually reinsert, reinsert a tendon graft later just to minimize the amount of uh, healing and the interface and the potential for scarring. So this is a picture of a pulley reconstruction. So you can see the belt and loop technique. So uh, in this case, uh, the uh, tendon, you can use Pomeris, you can use FCR, but Pomeris is what's classically described and uh, actually goes underneath the bone between the bone and the extensor tendon. And it wraps around like so, as you can see right here. <clears throat> So uh, as far as uh, post-operative rehab, um, is there uh, any modifications our therapist would do differently in the setting of a pulley reconstruction? Any recommendations that you would consider for a typical uh, two-stage reconstruction? So here's the final photo. So yeah. as far as, you know, the kind of uh, 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 protocol that, you know, of the ones that I've done that I've seen, I recommend if I feel good about my pulley reconstruction, I typically will begin gentle active range of motion uh, pretty quickly uh, in the setting of isolated pulley reconstruction, not mentioning, you know, not unless I'm doing something else for flexor tendon too. Um, and then I will typically pretty quickly move on to a, a dorsal blocking splint. And once the soft tissue is, uh, calm down enough uh, and that my wound uh, has healed enough, uh, then I will consider switching to a ring spring. And then uh, eventually once uh, I feel comfortable that the uh, pulley has healed properly, uh, and then I will do some sort of supportive taping um, uh, up to three months is, um, is the way that I've uh, approached it. <clears throat> Thank you, Shrikant. Do you want to jump in here with any thoughts on this reconstruct pulley reconstruction? Uh, I definitely think you, you want to, you know, do some form of early motion so you don't have one big scarred mess, and that helps also to control the edema and pain. Um, how far? How much? I'm not sure how much flexion you would allow, or if you would want them to be doing a hook fist where you got more excursion right under that reconstruction. So um, I don't know if there's any, if you have any recommendations about that based on your construct. So, I mean, can I comment on this please? Sure. Okay. So after surgery, maybe after maybe uh, 24 to 48 hours, I'll begin with wrist genodesis. So wrist flexion, finger extension, wrist extension, finger flexion. So if, if you look at the load transference on the pulley is only when you're performing active flexion of your finger. So the load starts to distribute, for example, uh, where, the, where, where the pulley is reconstructed. So you don't want excessive flexor tendon force exerting on, on the pulley that have been reconstructed. So this is the most safest method of getting the tendons gliding. This not only works on gliding of the tendons distally, but also proximally when you're bringing the wrist in extension and performing flexion. So it's only when you're asking the person to flex the finger, there'll be a load transference and you don't want the, the pulley reconstruction to fail. 
So I'll begin, begin that uh, X number of times during the day, maybe 15 to 20 reps every two hours during waking periods. They'll be given a splint that will hold the wrist in extension, MCP is in flex position, uh, IP is in, in neutral so that they don't develop any flexion contracture. And then you can go on to having uh, the active tendon load with the pulley, a ring pulley, or, or uh, as Chai suggested that maybe they should be given co-band wrap and co-band wrap and then range of motion gradually, increasing the amount of motion at the PIP and DIP joint. So we know that short arc of motion will definitely put shorter amount of stress at the pulley reconstruction. So you can begin with maybe starting off with 30 degrees arc of motion at PIP and DIP joint and gradually increasing by 15 degrees on a weekly basis. Trakant, thank you very much for that. And Dr. Wu, thank you for the great cases and for really helping us think about kind of pulley reconstruction in the context of flexor tendon rehabilitation, repair and rehabilitation. Um, with that, Dr. Wu, if you would um, stop sharing your screen and we are going to wrap things up for the evening. I just wanna give great gratitude to all of you that have stayed with us for the extra 16 minutes so far and to all of our great presenters and our faculty. Um, some take home messages from our talks tonight. We know that successful repair and rehabilitation of flexor tendon injuries requires comprehensive understanding and of and respect for biology and biomechanical principles. And what a great talk to start us off by Dr. Gupta. Providing operative specifics will help your therapists and patients achieve optimal outcomes. And this is definitely a partnership. And so when we really think about helping our patients achieve optimal outcomes, we really have to think about working together and communicating. Successful tenolysis requires careful planning and preparation, including maximizing passive range of motion preoperatively and intensive therapy postoperatively. Asking one tendon to work at three joints can create a swan neck tendency at the PIP joint, which can be avoided with orthoses to block and or redistribute forces. I really think um, tonight we've had a lot of different conversations about different ways that our orthoses or splints can actually be essential in the rehab process. And so really working with your therapist to understand what capacity they have to build these types of orthosis for the patients. Communication, um, we know that that's a key theme of this whole entire hand essential series. And so we know that communication is essential after both primary repair and complex reconstruction. The more information the therapist has, the better they can modulate therapy to rehabilitate patients safely. And finally, in our final talk from Dr. Wu, interventions such as Cobain or sil silicone rings, we had quite a few um, participants actually in the Q&A talk about silicone wedding rings and silicone rings um, can effectively reinforce pulley repairs. So a reminder, um, we have courses going all the way through June 10th on May 13th, next Thursday is extensor tendon injuries, May 20th, nerve compression and nerve injuries, May 27th, the wrist, June 3rd, elbow, and June 10th, we're very much looking forward to our international roundtable conversation. So a reminder, a link to the recording will be sent out through Zoom 24 hours after the conclusion of this webinar for everyone who is wet registered. Um, and I, I'll ask Mackenzie now to go ahead and put up our survey, which will help you gather your continuing education credits. Thank you so much to everybody for participating and for tuning in tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Have a wonderful weekend.